All right, this is an overview of Gobekli Tepe in its new state that it's in now, for it has what we call the potato chip, or the Pringle, over the top of it, and the cage around it here, and we're looking at the major circle that they have here in it, but there's also a few around the edges here. And recently I've done a video that showed that they've already, by measurements, figured out that it has sacred geometry written into it. Someone else has made a video here recently and it's just a piece of it. He goes in a long tirade and you'd have to pull this section out of it and I thought I might add it in here or something but it's easy enough to tell you about it. He said well if those points and circles making that triangle is there if you look at the flower of life or many other symbols that are like that that are going on the sacred geometry this triangle and its points would be about here inside a smaller circle and that that should be about the size of the diameter of the ring of this whole thing in fact it would go around it outside of it some what 12 to 15 meters or something the guy is saying and that there would be an extra circle around that but I've got another video coming up showing, and remember this whenever I said it, but in that video showing that there is a circumference of the whole mound that is in correlation to the triangle, to the points. And so a lot of people have looked at this and said, well, they had a temple and then they covered it up and built one over here and covered it up and built one here and try to come up with scenarios. We already see that there are certain ones that appear that they are for birthing and so on. And knowing the Sumerian iconography and the protective beast and how they did this thing, I said right off the bat, this one looks like that one if there were different ones because these have this and this. And it's funny how the certain pillars and certain ones show certain things. And we've seen how that correlates to the sky, the night sky exactly whenever they're saying that this time was built swirling around and it's got the zodiac in it well as above so below and they've got this effect built into it around the entire site and I'm you know kind of up in arms under whether they should keep it at this state or that they should try to take it back to where it was a lot of people disagree with the take it back where it was, and I'll tell you why I kind of, I, I flip-flop, I'll tell you why, is because, see these rocks that are on top of the stuff that's around there, it's just kind of scattered, and on top of the walls that are there, you know, there's just all these little rocks around in places, and just crap, and rocks that are around in here, and they don't know if those rocks were there or what part they were of or if they're part of this one pillar that broke apart and some of them they agree yeah this was part of this one thing in the centers of it and so they've left it in there but that would have never been there so either you're going to stick the pillar up and try to put it back together or, or leave it like this and the crap that's on top of the walls they honestly don't know if that's part of the ruined little tipper top or not so they just left it alone and dug out the spaces in between and around at angles. And in doing so, they leave it about half excavated and it would have never looked like this. Right? Well, there's another theory that I'll get into in here. For We're going to talk about sacred geometry over time, secrets of the Masons, Knights Templar, and how does that all connect? Well, most people would say, well, that, that can't connect to anything. Well, I'll make some connections in this video for you. But there are connections for sure that people know that the Knights Templar were looking for things like this. It's strange whenever I study stuff like this and I get into their mindset because they had no way of even knowing the pottery thing that we had figured out much much later going back into primordial time surely they didn't have that knowledge in some way and so they wouldn't even have a lineation 
but they don't have radiocarbon dating or anything like that either. And so if they don't have that technology to be able to discern, it makes their archaeology, which is kind of what they were doing, very odd, mystical, magical, if you will. And I feel like I have somewhat of an insight into this for studying Dungeons and Dragons and all that comes through. And people laugh at that somewhat and they say, oh, yeah, Dungeons and Dragons and griffins and unicorns and all this stuff. And I go, well, yeah, but I can tell you who fairies and brownies were. I can tell you where dragons come from. I can tell you where the breadth of it all and how far griffins come away and dragons and things that go with all of that. And so it, it makes a difference. And, you know, their folklore becomes myth and legend and it fades away into stories that people really don't think that it attaches to much anything more. But it does. And one important connection, and I don't think they say anything about it in this, was that Gobekli Tepe was thought to have been maybe a graveyard for Knights Templar and people that were on crusades and that's why it was left alone that they just kind of dissed it and it's amazing that we have it someone came out and said well it was rubble that people could see and the Knights Templar buried it again but I don't think there's any evidence for that necessarily. But it's amazing how people have put this Knights Templar on that. And we're about to talk about that in this video. For it's, can Gobekli Tepe reveal prehistoric Masonic secrets? It's just come out here in a paper a guy wrote. Our journey begins with the Freemasons. This late 16th century group occupies a strange, almost mythical place in modern popular culture, and while invoking many conspiracies and self-proclaimed society with secrets, was on the face of it really just a club where ambitious individuals could network at will and help establish themselves, their family, and their business in the upper echelons of society. However, it, the core of the Freemasons' beliefs is a continuation and a preservation of ancient rituals, belief, and standing people. Where does these rituals stem from is a pivotal question to our investigation. Gobekli Tepe's Masonic secrets may tell us more about the origins of these rituals that were shown up in Masonic times. A brief history of the Freemasons and the Knights Templar goes into at the heart of Freemasonry lies the equally mysterious the poor soldiers of Christ and the Temple of Solomon, or as the more commonly known the Knights Templar in 1119 under French nobleman Hugues de Payens. The Templars were officially ordered to protect the pilgrims on their route to the Holy Land of Jerusalem. And, uh, however, as a researcher, Graham Hancock alludes to in his preeminent work, The Sign of the Seal, unofficially this group of hardened knights may well have been using their time in the East to find and recover lost relic and artifacts to bring back to Europe. And Hancock's got that in his book. Um, and hopefully I've shown you in a lot of these videos, if you've been with me for a while, that the people that we think of being through this area, and indeed Egypt, Sumeria, even where we consider Yemen today, and Ethiopia today, isn't necessarily who the people were in the ancient times, and we realize where that comes from, and as all that dried up into a desert and became unusable, and the ground became sour, like in the Micmac Indian burial ground of Pet Cemetery. Yeah, in that circle. I'll make a connection for that in a video coming up, but it'll be more about Amerindian origins, things along that line. Let's just go on. 
very quickly these warrior monks became proto-archaeologists. According to British Army surveys in the 1860, evidence of the Templars' exhaustive excavations were clearly visible everywhere. Such evidence includes tunnels and shafts up to 80 feet or 24 meters deep within the precinct of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And it said the Templars were looking for the remains of the very monument their name is derived from, Solomon's Temple. And this might be a time to interject the fact that we do know that Probably the main story out of any of this that we get out of the Crusades into a modern time would be the Knights of King Arthur and the Round Table and how they were searching for the Holy Grail to bring it back to them. And people think that there were only Crusades, if you will, of this sacred knowledge and keeping back into the motherland or the holy land they'd come from but indeed it did go both ways and in fact some of the people that you would think of as West Europeans definitely have their roots far off in the holy land and past where we're talking about right so where were all these crusades and stuff? Well, you're, you're told about all these right here. Yeah, but uh, we aren't told about a lot of things. And the reason that you're not is because, well, something bad happened out of it, and they ended up killing them all off and stuff that it had really gotten out of hand, and they didn't like it. And there's a reason behind that. And I'll try to go into it here shortly. While it's not been confirmed what or even if the Templars found, if anything, it is certainly curious that for nine years they lived in poverty. But as soon as their excavations ended, they were suddenly massively rich and very quickly the rumors of strange rituals started to circulate. Well, there got to be a pilgrimaging and taking back and forth and things like that and it became quite a business religion and such can become such a thing quite easily and in that endeavor they ended up coming somewhat rich but they were supposed to be these poor knights and they even rode two to one horse well that can be looked at as one thing but it can be looked at as another These new distinctly odd Templar traditions led some to believe that the Templars did in fact find ancient scrolls, possibly leading back to the pre-Judaic times. And I'm here to tell you that they did. In fact, the evidence that people go with in knowledge of Sophia, as in philosophia, or philosophy is the love of wisdom, and in Nana, and the study of wisdom and the wisdom of the ancients and correlation and rituals that had gone on long before the Bible. And they were able to discern that happened. And in the process, I mean, there, there is a famous city named Sophia. It holds a beautiful statue, which I wish I was showing you a picture of now and things. And this goes along with it, just like when Hannibal Barca came in and left behind places like Barcelona that you call Barcelona nowadays. It's in your face too, like in that movie about Mars. Well, what does Mars and Aries have to do with Barcelona? Oh, it, 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 you'd have to get deep into it and it really does have a lot to do with it. And why does that movie put off in that way? And it, yet, yeah, if you'll catch it all, and then the fact that he was somebody that was a cowboy in the Wild West, but take him back a couple of generations and who he would have possibly been. And it might reveal things. All you've got to do is displace things a few times. 
and it comes a brand new story. And pieces of this story and that story can get put in modern things and lost in the mist. Where I was told a long time ago, all the stories have already been told. You're just telling them again. And then what's funny is I was studying guitar and they said, no, oh, Jimmy Page pretty much did every lead lick that there will ever be created. No matter what you do, you're doing something that he pulled off in there. And people were like, Jimmy Hendrix, and they go, same thing. And Jimmy Hendrix was doing jazz chords, mimicking saxophone lines and things like that that he did in other bands whenever the saxophone guy didn't show up. But he's good enough to do it, of course. But that's people don't realize that's what's going on whenever some of that, that odd guitar parts are going on. Anyhow, that's pretty far off from what we've been talking about. But they found these ancient scrolls and ancient stuff. Let's just go with that broad term of ancient times. And it led them to a totally different looking aspect about the church somewhat. And they pretty much had to keep it secret. Or it came out off as that they were doing so. Looking back at it right to vilify it in some way mm, oh it's it's looked as the ultimate pagan thing the templars went down there and they got swooed by a genie and next thing you know they were pagans in service of christ what the hell and it's like no that isn't the way that went down at all but what i said first is the way we look at it. It is from these stories that the Masonic rituals spawned. Unfortunately for the Templars, they were too eager to embody their new traditions. And, in a twist of cruel irony, they became the target of the same organization that supported them during the Crusades. In fact, it was directly out of that. It would be if you looked at something like Shaolin monks and then they had something come out of that to do it. It was exactly that. Oddly enough. Unfortunately for the Templars, though, this infamous led to the last known members of the Templars being burned at the stake in 1312. And Friday the 13th, while their cult slowly faded into obscurity of medieval history. And people have said there are reasons for that and everything that went on. I could go off in left field now, but let's, let's go off in right field for a change here. For we're looking at the ceiling of, what's the name of this place? Uh, Freemasons Hall in the United Grand Lodge of England, located in London. Notice the cosmic symbolism present throughout the artwork. Well, duh, if anybody's been initiated into any of this to any degree, they should be able to see this happening. So, let's see if I can just go easy with you here. The focus of the room is the sun, but oddly, the sun is on a black background, not of day. But that's the way it really goes on as soon as you get off the planet, isn't it? Day and night is a reference that we have here. World spin round and round. Sun come up, moon go down, world spin round and round. Time for another lesson. If we look around this place, it's all done in sacred geometry and points, links, and so on. But there are little swirls and circlets that are here that actually would have been swirls and circlets or if things worked out differently in World War II never happened, would have been swastikas and things that look very much like that. And it would have had the same concept and meaning, symbology, somewhat, but slightly different. If one was to look closely at these medallions, they may appear to be the same, but they are meant to indicate four cardinal points of a zodiac at a certain point in time. If we look, we find two sacred pillars, i.e. a portal, leading to a sun, 
we find the same effigy over here leading to a moon. In the sun effigy there are fires burning. In the moon there is smoke and incense. These rituals can be put together and you see them in modern rituals of Catholics and things that still linger on when they're holding on to that stuff that if they dropped it you may not ever known these things. The whole room here is surrounded by four angels. Notice that they're cut into the angles of the corners and they're at the opposing four cardinal points i.e. the four winds. Ding. But notice how the angles is spelled very much like the angels. Notice how we have again something symbolizing day and dawn in the background with clouds or smoke or trees and sacred animals but an all-seeing eye very much like the eye of Horus and so on that you have on the dollar bill and everybody knows about that but if we look here we have two pillars representing the same thing in a darkened nighttime effigy and this Star of David. This is the symbol of Saturn, right? Now, I could go out in left field in a thousand ways right here, but let's just continue. So this is the God of night and of long term. This is the God of now and day, the way it's working out. After this point in time, this effigy becomes Jupiter. And then we start looking at things saying, well, it's the storm god that takes over. And indeed, in rituals that went on, they were dedicated to a storm god and you can imagine whenever this area started turning into a desert and people were begging for rain and so on to flood their fields to make it all happen and the world to go around that they went through rituals about that but this and even modern religions hug on to this symbology and this point and it is a temple of the sun and the two pillars and the moon and the two pillars. And what are we talking about? Well, there are times during the year that the sun comes up between two pillars. And there are times whenever the moon comes up between two pillars. And you can marry these things. And so one version of the temple of Solomon is the sun, Saul, and the moon, Mon, which we get Sunday and Moon Day or Monday from. Indeed, all the days of the week are. Saturday is for Saturn. But it changes also here because Jupiter has a 12 year cycle. And so he is the representation at nighttime of the God during the day. I could go another layer, but we're at 25. Let's just go. Hmm, that's in Wikipedia Commons. Oldest of three core embedded traditions, according to researchers Knight and Lomas, who both became Freemasons in part to help their own personal quest for understanding. Our past center around astronomical metaphors and cosmic symbolism. And I've just explained some of it to you. The astronomical metaphors and cosmic symbolism. I indeed tried to put that into one word. We could make up a new one about it. Astrometaphorcosmicalism. Both Knight and Lomas believe that in the Templar rituals, which they personally encountered during their years of membership, that they believe the origins of these rituals laid extremely mysterious European Neolithic cultures. Aye, it goes that way. But some of that 
which we've explained, comes from the other way, and some of it comes from the Holy Land and tribe of Dan, and who are the twelve? Right. Megalithic grooved wear people of Great Britain. Hmm, hitting my ballpark a little bit. The Book of Hiram, written by Knight and Lomas in 2004, focuses on megalithic builders from Neolithic period, 12,000 to 4,000 years ago. So this is looking at coming out of the Younger Dryas through and into what we actually know of as modern recorded history, and it fades off. But we've gotten past that point now and in my lifetime whose direct work includes the world-renowned Stonehenge in Wiltshire, England, New Grange in the Boyne Valley, and there's much more monuments, and I've shown some recently in Boyne, Ireland and all of its connections, and the Ring of Brogdar, which again I did a video about just recently. In Scotland, ample evidence shows that the Neolithic builders were extremely active around the fringes of the Irish Sea over 5,500 years ago. Well, if you would add in the fact that they have that giant boat dock that they found 30 foot below the water that would have been exposed at about 8,800 to 9,200 B.C. and before, so it could be older, and that they... Notice that it's a shipwright boat building dock, and those Irish men, they're all about building boats like the Titanic and so on. But you can take it all the way back to the Titans and so on of ancient times and who all these people were. And I've tried to say a bunch of different times that the gods of the Greeks and their mythology was not of around them. You can look at their symbology and their stories, and even Herodotus and stuff, they are looking all over the place for information and compiling it in. It's not just one little mountain thing that happened. It's put upon it. These Neolithic peoples are also known as the Grooved Ware people, named for the unique style of groove pottery. These people were most likely responsible for the magnificent centers of culture that flourished in places like the Scottish Orkney Islands I did a video about, at the sites like Scarab Bray and Mays Howe dating back at least 3200 B.C. That's a cool shirt. Looks all 3D. Basing his theory on the alignments of megalithic structures with equinoxes and solstices, the early 20th century editor and prestigious journal Nature, Sir Norman Lockyer, believed that Scarabray and potentially other sites of the Orkney archipelago situated at the northernmost tip of Scotland, were the quarters for trainee astronomer priests, perhaps. Of course, like most who push the boundaries of what we know to be true, Lockyer was ridiculed by his academic peers. However, he has since been proven right. Here's a look at one of the buildings of Scara Bray and these hobbit-type homes. Knock, knock. Other megalithic sites, man, including but not limited to Avebury, Newgrange, and Stonehenge may have also served similar purposes, acting as ancient schools where astronomy of druids could have been transmitted. Further, the megalithic structure of these sites points to the fact that the architects, the grooved ware people, were extremely adept at moving and accurately positioning extremely large stones, for example, Stonehenge's sarsen stones, which weighs more than 25 tons or 50,000 pounds. And it appears that they do it fairly with ease. And in fact, later cultures said that this had been done by giants. Dance of the Giants. Knights and Lomas theorized that given the concentration of megalithic structures across Orkney, it seems reasonable to suppose that even certain megalithic sites, including Scara Bray, might have been a kind of Neolithic university. Similarities arise between the theories of Lockyer, Knight, and Lomas on the use of these European sites, which are similar to theories by the late German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt, and he's the one who did a few different sites and ended up at Gobekli Tepe. Smith was famously quoted by Hancock in 2015 as interpreting a world-renowned site, the southeastern Anatolian region of Turkey, as a platform 
for the distribution of knowledge and innovation. Interestingly, as we now shall see, this site features as the same hallmarks as its European counterparts, and then some. So it's a continuation that's shown here, but also shown in places like Arkham, going the other way, and ancient sun circles leading all the way through what we call the Silk Road, but it was there long before then, and ancient circles to Nabta Playa I recently did a video on, and other places through the Holy Land that had this same situation. Here's a close-up of that one circle. So you see the haphazard rocks that are just extra in here. Should they clean that up a little more and clean this up a little more? I know they shouldn't let people walk around here like Hancock got to do and stuff because people would touch and mess with things and one day a wall would fall down or something. You know, you, you, you understand that. But should they leave it right at this level? I mean, somebody got it here and took a picture of it and they go leave it like that. Let me know what you think. Gobekli Tepe's Masonic Secrets According to Schmidt. Schmidt's theory focused on the megalithic masterpiece of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, a site that believed to be over 11,000 years old. That's more than 6,000 years before the supposed creation of Stonehenge at England and Egypt's Great Pyramids. If there's one thing that we take away from this, it's that that place exists. And so all of a sudden there's a bunch of validations but you have to understand it was buried and it's the only reason it's there and if it was still left it would have been gone long ago well how did Stonehenge stay? well it's uh, so huge megalithic but also there were people there protecting it the whole time it didn't seem to ever really shift off of that in fact the new people that came in embraced it too because it all hooked up together with all that they had going on nothing was different some of the stories changed a little bit some of it turned into mythology and folklore and stuff and twisted into this weird pie that you've got that you just can't quite taste what flavors are in that, but you recognize it. Whoever the architects behind Gobekli Tepe or the pot-bellied hill were, they had a deep and thorough understanding of astrology. Through the work of researchers including Graham Hancock and Professor Martin Sweatman and Demetrios Tsikros in 2017, it has become apparently that not only the site astronomically aligned, but that Pillar 43 likely refers to the date 10,950 BC, give or take 250. Said another way, the megalithic stonework at the site may be a commemoration of the known last ice age and the younger driest period and what had happened during then. If, like me, you find this utterly fascinating, I highly recommend the comprehensive and academically unbiased approach produced by the University of Edinburgh's Professor Martin Sweatman in his Prehistory Decoded, or in the supporting video series here, and you can click on it, and it's here. I'll try to put a link to this in here, but you know where I'm at. For in-depth look at the Stone Age astronomical alignment, and its potential implications. In fact, I may even try to do one on the videos or a portion of it. So who were the builders of Gobekli Tepe? Well, those responsible for building Gobekli Tepe were masters of megalithic masonry. They were able to shape, cut, and place large stone objects, some weighing over 15 tons with high level of precision, and they also had the scientific knowledge to include astronomical symbolism in their stonework at the same time. Clearly one of these main questions that plagues us then is who was responsible for this site. While this question is certainly a poignant one and one that has sparked many debates, the answer is essentially to understanding of human development and prehistory. And I've done a lot of videos trying to explain what I believe definitely and what the uh, information keeps showing me is how everything laid down and who those certain people were. Hancock famously postulated that a lost civilization helped sow the seeds necessarily for megalithic structures like Gobekli Tepe, possibly originating in the Americas, tracing them back through north and south in his 219 or 2019 work, America Before. 
and I've touched upon this same concept too, and I haven't read his book at all, and I didn't know he was going there with this idea. But we've recently looked at the Calico dig site and things, and it could indeed go another way, and this tale of Atlantis could be something that in modern day we would look at in a totally different light, but yet might have something to do with truth and reality too. Researchers Andrew Collins and Greg Little have put forward the idea of the mysterious Denisovans. Our ancient hominid ancestors had a helping hand in mysterious developmental processes. And I've got a video coming that's going to have some validation in that idea too. For as we look back, we can tell that we're standing on the backs of giants that are holding up the world, i.e. the Atlas, the Atlanteans, the people from before, all in a series of events and it's not like popcorn like people had said and it keeps looking like but it had happened over a period of time and people doing developments the thing that's happening is what we see is the people that come out of that and their massive developments and we're using them today and it's quite amazing but also somewhat devastating that we can't have a memory back past a certain point in fact religious things and stuff that went on kind of drew it that way and had that directive to it and kind of made it happen wanted to make all of the other things go away whenever we find through our research that it all goes together but it's this long drawn out process and it didn't poof like what's said any information may, that may help solve this riddle would be speculatory, important, big or small. And so now we can see it before they put the potato chip over it. And the fact that all we were looking at was one little small section of the pie. In fact, one good bite of the pie out of it. And it's got some good pecans and stuff in it and take a good bite. Walnuts, whatever you prefer. But that site is much bigger and carries on. When they put the potato chip over this one site, it's going to require an astrodome if you want to do it correctly, but mm, I'm guessing individual potato chips is where it's going here. And all these little boards and lead-ins that they used to use to climb down and into certain little spots are all been taken away. But some of the edges of this are still there in their platforms up under the new platform. So, Gobekli Tepe, the pot-bellied hill, the site where paradigms were shifted, dogma was broken, and our understanding of human history changed forever. Well, for people, it's a real vindication for people that have been in these type of studies and telling you, you know, I, they told me it went ugh, and as I went into it, they didn't want me to go into it, and I'm like, what the hell? And then I come to find out, well, you didn't go ugh. And what did the Knights Templar figure out? And, and what did the what did Hitler figure out supposedly about blah blah blah? So what he did something wrong with it, did it, did it, and everything, and hooked up Mussolini, and did it. Okay, what do you find out that he thought was so damn important? Well, you come to find out a lot of that's been studied now and all validated. It's just what he did with it. But in fact, it goes even deeper than they probably could have ever done, and they didn't know anything about Gobekli Tepe and everything, and it was all conjecture from there. So it goes on past that point. So if we're talking about the Aryans in the time of Aries, surely we're talking about also pre-Aryans and pre-Proto-Aryans and going back and it staggers all the way back into time of Cro-Magnon. They were the first people that had advanced weapons compared to anything that had come before. They had taken it far, far differently. If we look at our recent history and go back 300 years, 400 years, and go to now, that far, far difference, it's almost a jump like that. People don't give it the respect of that, but that is a far jump. Just like even being able to build these flat pillars and do this concept off astronomy is a gigantic leap for mankind. Almost as powerful as that first step on the moon. But no, no in no way, for those people of that time were doing worshipping on the moon. If you were to tell them one day we're going to do this thing and land on there and we're going to do it and come back. Imagine this. An odd trail of connections. If this goes into a part two, it'll be in your top left-hand corner. I'll try to end. 
Having painstakingly tracked their line of inquiry over Masonic history through the series of historical connections based on ancient Masonic rituals inherited from the Templar Knights, researchers Knight and Lomas kept their coming back to the Groovedware people of Europe and moreover how they may have seeded their information into an unidentified proto-Norse culture that if people look at was the snake biting itself in the first place. Mm, let's continue. I find it fascinating that Andrew Collins in his most recent article discusses the genetic link between ancient Icelandic cultures and Denisovans, and I will in this paper that's coming up. He says the engineering sophistication and innovation that went into the construction of Gobekli Tepe might well have originated not just from the dis direction of the Ural Mountains, but also with Finno-Ugaritic language speaking peoples. And I agree, we can see that that is all the same people and there was a time before whenever they had culminated and spread and culminated and spread. Hopefully we see that. Where am I at? 41? Cool. Could this be the same lineage that was found in the inquiry about Masonic tradition also? Knight and Lomas both believe that this Norse religion was an entirely complementary component to the concepts they found within Masonic Templary rituals. Could it have been actually much deeper clue about the origins or originators of Gobekli Tepe? Yeah, well, you can see that it goes back a step. All these people had similar symbologies and things going on. And it goes back a step to a time whenever they did, just like this Proto-Indo-European linguistics can take a couple of steps back and they all would have understood each other. Talks about a situation like that in the Bible differently. They were going to build a tower to heaven and it scared God. And they said, if they get together like this, what could they do? So then everything had to be ruined so they couldn't do that and everybody get mumbo jumbo and get confused in fact that's what it means number one knowledge capable of creating precise astronomical alignments number two ability to move place shape and carve megalithic structures number three speculation about these sites being centers where information was dis, uh, disseminated out to people, specifically information relating to astronomy and megalithic masonry. The identity of the architects of these sites is still being debated or unknown. There's a fifth point also, though, first discovered by Alexander Thom, a professor of engineering at Oxford University and the founder of what we now call archaeoastronomy. He uh, measurement of approximately 0.83 modern meters or 2.7 feet is the megalithic yard. The uh, megalithic yard measurement is present at countless megalithic sites across the world including Stonehenge, the pyramids of Giza, and numerous sites around the Mediterranean region. Well, I'm showing in my sacred geometry thing how it all works off human common body parts from the inch to the foot, but people's feet aren't, yeah, I, I understand that's because it's 12 and 6, the Sumerian thing and stuff, but it goes back before that for how they break things down in measurements for it's seen in all of nature and everything and they kept that ideal going on in architecture that they still instill in buildings to this day the unit is derived from three factors the spin of the earth on its axis the orbit of the earth around the sun and the mass of the earth and you can utilize these and get the idea and the pyramids are built on a geographic center of earth like on ley lines where it would be a massive 